All right, here we are. The next episode of The Rich Life Projects and obviously we're in a little bit of a different environment today being in uh, in the other side of the uh, Australia. And today I've got someone special I want to talk to who's intrigued me with his training. I want to know the backsides of it. And he's one of Australia's uh, you know, strength coaches and works with some of the great uh, some of the great athletes, me. He's here. It's been a I'm bit here in the bedroom. <laughs> He's here in, 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 in the studio, mate. Studio. <laughs> How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good. What what has been happening in your life? I know that's a silly question because I know you're a busy man. But what's what's been what's been happening at the moment? Well, it's fight week. Hundred percent here with Tyson. Um, last time I was in a fight week with Tyson, it was I think you were seeing Melbourne two forty three. So yeah. almost four years ago. Otherwise, it's been um, you know busy building the the ethos brand, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into talking. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It intrigues me with that the ethos brand, and then you have got great athletes under it, which obviously athletes, great athletes, don't stay somewhere if there's if it's no good. Correct. So yeah, hundred percent. So that yeah. So the focus for us has been to you know continue establishing ourselves as the the authority on developing combat athletes. Uh, in terms of high performance mm. and obviously now trying to take on some education as well as, you know, I was, we were talking about business earlier, trying to just diversify the brand and see where we can kind of help more and do, do bigger and better things. Yeah. Yep. So I've been busy with that. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's life, in a nutshell. And then we life, can diverge life, into life. Life in general is busy, Correct. busy, Correct. my friend. So let's go back to obviously where it all starts growing up. Yeah. Where does me where does me grow up? So my my background is Kurdish. Um, okay. So I don't know if you know the Kurds. No. Nope. I grew up most of my life having to explain to people who the Kurds are. Yeah. So I can do it again. You can do it so here. Kurds are. You could go back to saying one of the oldest people, um, older civilizations. Wow. So we date back to like Mesopotamia period. So kind of like the Sumerian age, start of the Neolithic revolution for all the history wow. geeks, right? You are you are old then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, so yeah, I didn't know that. I was um I was born overseas. Technically, we don't we don't have a country, so it's the world's largest minority. Um, there's approximately like sixty million Kurds scattered all over the world, and so my family migrated here. Typical war torn country story. I came to Australia when I was three with my older sister. Uh, I grew up in Sydney's West. So I grew up in Auburn and Granville, went to school there. As you know, it's not the, it's, it's a tough place to grow up and you're, you're definitely. exposed to all sorts of crowds, but definitely gave me thick skin and I've made a lot of friends and developed character traits that I still have today. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. And then as I grew up, you know, I, sports was a big part of life. Uh, I played soccer. I played all sorts of sports and around the age of 14, uh, I started Muay Thai. And I said oh, really? kickboxing. Yeah. Yeah, I started kickboxing. Hey. So my first my first coach was um Sifu Chan, Czech Fai. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I used to train with him at Broadway. Um, oh wow. Yeah. Man, yeah. he I think Chuck Kun. Fai was uh I think he was uh one of the like was his wife one of the WKA I'm pretty June sure. Chuck yes. June Chuck Fai. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Was, when, so, when we were fighting back in the day, she was like the head honcho for WKA. Okay. So well, kickboxing association. Wow. Czech Fe was um, my first coach, and then I started training MMA at that time as well. Um, just Google gyms in Sydney and started training, and then on honestly, from there, I met so many coaches, and um, I started training at Boxing Works at the time at Larry's Gym. Um, my wrestling coach there, his name was Mark. I was really enjoying things with him. He suggested I, you know, try try some more wrestling. So I met. Uh, guys at Sydney Wrestling Academy. Um, I was doing some training with Lenny, who's a very well-known wrestling coach yep. in Australia. Um, and then I ended up moving further out towards like Wenny, uh, went with Phil. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I started training at Full Combat Center at that time. That was with Shane Nix. Yeah, uh, okay. When, wow. when him and his brother opened that gym. And at that gym, I met my boxing coach, Rodney Williams. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah right. Rodney, yeah, um, definitely. He's still going around too, is, Rodney. I, was, I think he's- uh, He's got a few fighters that have been on the No Limits. Definitely. Uh, yeah. He's got um, Manuel, one of my guys still, Cohen Mazudia, yep. uh, the first fighter I ever started working with. Wow. Uh, and so Rodney made me really fall in love with boxing. So I started boxing pretty much as the only combat sport that I was doing at the time. Um, so I moved away from the grappling and MMA and started doing boxing with Rodney, kind of followed him around to the gyms that he was going to. So then I fought amateur boxing under Rodney and then under Blacktown PCYC. 
And these days I definitely don't compete and I wouldn't consider myself <laughs> an athlete by any means. But uh, there came a point where I realized that my interest, my interests were more in the development of athletes rather than being an athlete. And I always say that in a, it's, a, it's an accumulation of me maybe not having the coaching figures that I needed at the right time, the right guidance, the right advice. Uh, and so I guess that's one of my philosophies as a coach now is I kind of want to be the coach that I wish that I had. Yeah, um, this, true, the true. support system that I wish that I had when I was an aspiring fighter. Yep. Because I like every other fighter that I meet now who, who I ask, you know, what is your dream? Yeah. They tell me I want to be a world champion. Yeah. And I'm sure Rich, you've heard that oh, many times man. yourself. Many a times, many a times. And so for me, I mean, that was my dream when I was a kid too, right? You'd watch, you know, everyone yeah, yeah. and all these guys on TV and be yeah. like, that's awesome. But I guess the cool thing is, is me now as a coach. I've actually worked with people who ended up becoming those people. Hundred percent. And so it's nice to be able to look back and you know see those experiences, see what traits and what qualities it does actually take to to become a world champion. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we are now. Over the last almost seven to eight years, my whole professional career has been dedicated to working with combat sport athletes. Yep. Um, I took a big risk in a sport that not a lot of people said you should put all your eggs in that basket. That's true. Especially because my industry, the strength and conditioning community, it's already a niche industry in itself. And I niched in the niche. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was just because I guess the way I was raised was like, you know, do something you you enjoy, do mm. what you're passionate about. Yep. And I wasn't really passionate about working with other athletes at that time. Yeah, okay, I wanted to true. help fighters. Um, just like you've been all over the world with what you're doing, um, I I had to go and, you know, learn learn the the craft and network overseas in America. That, that's what I was gonna get to with when when you say learning the craft, I did sort of uh, catch up where you sought international experience. Correct. And you went over and, and trained under a very successful um, or recognised facility. Correct. Um, tell, tell us a bit, bit about, one, how did you find that? Yep. Uh, and, and how did that sort of mould you into, you know, your, your outlook now on, on your profession? So, you know the phrase, coaches need coaches. Um, oh. And every, call it successful person, whatever that means, has – as mentors that guide them, whether it's a parent, whether it's a distant mentor, whether it's someone who's passed away, but you read their books, right? 100%. So I, at the time, couldn't really find a physical place in Sydney that was doing what I wanted to do. So call it ethos eight years ago, it didn't exist. Yeah, okay. uh, I wanted to take part and learn in a high performance environment for combat athletes. And when I realized it didn't exist, I networked with the people that I knew at the time and they said, here are a couple of names for you to contact. And they were all in America. Oh wow! So yeah. I contacted all three of them. Two of them said that they weren't really offering what I was after, which yeah. was nice on their part because they were honest. That's right. That's right. The third person didn't respond a few times. I kept persisting, kept persisting, didn't rep reply to emails. So I called his facility and then his assistant picked up and she said, this is very strange. He, he normally is very responsive. And then she said, he will get back to you ASAP. Um, he, his name is uh, Lauren Landau, who is uh, one of my mentors. He's been a good friend of mine for years now. And so I packed up, or I tried to pack up and go to America. <laughs> so I, I, he, I got accepted into the program there. Um, I was 23 at the time, was really excited, bought my tickets and everything, had accommodation at my auntie's organized in Denver, Colorado, which mm -hmm. is where their facility is. And then Trump had that embargo clause, what have you, where essentially people who were born in particular countries couldn't visit the United States on, oh, the, ESTA, wow. on the ESTA waiver program. Oh, so wow. I had to apply for a non-immigrant visa with the embassy, which meant I had to cancel that trip. Oh, so wow. Lauren and his crew were really cool because they worked around it and they still welcomed me three months later, I believe okay. two or three months later. Yep. And so I packed up, spent the money again. And so I guess you can call it, you know, there's a book called Grit and uh -huh. it's, a, it's a really cool book because- at its essence, it's if I if I now if I if I simplify what the message is, it's being able to eat shit yep. and continue moving forward. Yeah, right. that's what it is. And so I think that's something that probably by way of just my background, my, my culture, where I grew up, my dad was very strict on us, um, is just having grit. 
Yeah. And you know, you lose money, it's okay, keep going. That's it. You don't get allowed into a country, that's okay, keep going. Yeah. So when I got to Denver, I was still paying rent at the gym that I was working at here uh, and paying rent where I was oh, living. Really? Wow. And I was obviously paying while I was there. I had to pay for food, I had to pay for things. I was staying with my auntie who was an hour and 15 minutes down south in the Springs. And I was driving up every single morning to this facility. And I was pumped, man. I was so oh, excited. Yeah. Because when I got to that facility at that time, they were housing athletes such as, you know, TJ Dillashaw, okay. Neil Magny, Drew Dober, oh, Curtis really? Blades, yeah, Justin right. Gaethje. Yep. And when I walked into that facility, I just remember like thinking, man, I want to build this sort of a place one day. This is wow. awesome. Like, yep. This is what, this isn't, you know, a, a rusty shed type gym where it's just, it's it's not professional. It's not high perform. It's not really high performance. And I wanted to build that because I wanted to give that to the combat community. And so I developed relationships there. I learned a lot. I just soaked that experience all in. And then I came back and I continued just chipping away, working with combat athletes, yep. working for, for free with some of them and working for really, really cheap with others. I was working 30 to 40 hours as like a PT at the gym that I was working at to facilitate income so I could pay my bills. Yep. And then I was on top of that doing research and all the driving around coaching fighters because I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do. Yep. Uh, and then I did that for a good couple of years, moved to a facility that allowed me to have some more space. In that facility, the the recognition of the brand really grew, really organically at the same time. Yeah. Just started working with a lot of fighters there. Yeah. The numbers just kept growing. And I think it was, I don't, I can't say that I can narrow down exactly why these fighters wanted to work with me, yep. but I've asked, I've asked the ones that have stayed around. Yep. You know, I asked Tyson, yep. why have you stayed around? I've yep. asked Cambosis, why have you stayed around? And I think for all of them, it's the answer is very synonymous with the fact that they can see how passionate I am about yep. the, the field. Yep. And they probably have that same passion towards their purpose you know, being more champions, yeah. being the best they can be. And I think when you're around that sort of a person and that sort of an environment, it's contagious. Yeah, you, definitely. You want to be around those yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And till this day, most people, when they come into the ethos facility, they they feel that energy. Yeah. Um, they feel that contagious, you, you know, uh, it's it's almost like an internal drive that everybody has to be better. And, and when you go there, you want to be there. Yeah, you want to yeah. train with those people. Yeah. And that's why when you when you say uh, you've you know you're doing the PTs here, then you're doing the free training here, and I, I went through that period as well when when I went to Jackson Wiggle John and your whole pads for everyone because obviously they had superstars over there, and that's where not only you, do you learn the skill, well I learned the skill of pad holding off someone like Greg Jackson and Wiggle John. But when you're doing it for free, it's not really for free. It wasn't free for me. I was just like, I'm just happy to hold pads yeah. for some of these athletes best in the world and just see if I can actually handle what they throw at me as a pad holder yeah. and, a, and a coach. <laughs> yeah. But that's – and I get when you say you've got to – you got to compromise. You got to sacrifice. And you were doing PTs to pay your rent here, and then but you were doing free to get credibility, then to get the knowledge and have those clients uh, know exactly where you come from there. Yep. And uh, but and you say that, and now you've you got that uh, ethos center, and some of the obviously Tyson Pedro, uh, Ty Tuivasa. You've had uh, Arlene, who's just going back to Jackson, but I think she's back again she's now. Fighting in April, yeah. April again, and she fought some great fights with in Bellator. She's fought and for two world titles against Janae, Cyborg. Janae Harding. I think I remember going to Memphis with yeah. with Arlene, yeah, yeah, and she yeah. fought um, Julia Budd. Yeah, and that was an experience because I've you know I got got over to she that. that. She won that fight. Hundred percent, she did. <laughs> I was so, I oh, I just I she outpointed her. Yeah, and done enough to win that fight. Yep. And I was, I was that I was that pissed at that, but anyway, that's another life. But, you know, Ebony Bridges, um, as you say, George Cambosis. Yep. So when these guys stay around, as you say, because of the passion that you show, because of what your journey has been, what, what's that feeling like to you? One, because you're passionate about it. Yep. But two, you know, your work is getting done correctly. I think it was Brad Riddell who, who put a post up. I believe it was him explaining the emotions around a fight where he says, you know, when you prepare for a fight, there's a high, you're in a rush in hormones, the whole experience. It's very, it's very captivating, right? And then you have the fight 
And then the next day, it's almost like, oh, that's it. It's like a massive oh. adrenaline dump. Right? Oh, and I think um, for me, it's what you said earlier kind of resonated with me where you don't see them as figures. You see them as people. Mm. And I've always done that with the athletes that I work with. So w- one thing that I've always tried my best to do is back my athletes yep. when nobody believed that they could be who they are now. I believed in them wholeheartedly because I also believed in myself. Yep. Um, I started working with George about seven years ago, around a similar time I started working with Tyson. Wasn't, wasn't that an incredible story? Right. And huh? so I remember oh, working yeah. with George when he, our first fight was at the Melbourne Pavilion. Uh, and then seven years later, he's fighting at, you know, Marvel Stadium. So Crazy. It's, that- it's cool because I was around to see everything that was required to have that moment. And the people around him too. Correct. Because that's, that's always a big thing. We of get, course it is. We get into things where you go, oh, you know, the athletes, your coach and relationship, but I was only talking to a friend downst- downstairs and, again, it's, it's some of these people who hang on who, you know, when he first started, he probably had no one beside him, you know, like yourself and his father and a few others. But when you get to that level, then next minute, well, who's this dude? What Everyone wants to be with George. Or- I think we're, we're a culmination of our environment, our experiences, and then the people around us. And then there's always a little sprinkle of luck in any That's story. That's right, true to that. And if you look at, say, someone like George, he did surround himself with the right people. He did take those experiences, you know, going to Fortune, spending time with Pacquiao, yep. going to America several times, having camps over there. And those are the sacrifices. And despite however many hiccups I'm sure he's had along the way, yeah. he displayed the same characteristic of grit and yep. just showing up and going again and yep. going again. Yep. Um, so how it feels for me to be in that position to work with these athletes, I put a post up today. I'm just always grateful mm. because uh, I think a good coach doesn't do it for the for the perceived fame or doesn't do it for the glamour that comes with saying, oh, you know, I'm here fight with Tyson Pedro. It's cool. That's right, yeah. um, you, you do it just to see them succeed them succeeding is a fulfillment. That's right. So when Tyson came back last year and had his first win after four years, man, I was crying because I knew how much he went through. I was going to say, that. you you had emotionally invested yourself in. 100%. And, yeah, and I know that feeling because I've invested in fighters myself so so heartily and, yeah, that's that, that's an emotional roller coaster right there. It really is. I mean, Tyson, he's – I think with coaching, it's never just as – Black and white is you're the coach and they're the athlete. By way of working with them and getting to know them, you form a relationship. And some relationships are stronger than others because you just get along in That's other right. ways. It's just a connection. So, yeah, Tyson and I, I can d- genuinely consider him a very close friend of mine. Yep. You know, outside of the gym, we speak, we we talk about life and yep. goals and visions and family and kids and that sort of stuff. So. For, for me to say last year when he fought and I could I could see that he was trying to not cry after he won. 100%. When, yeah. um, when he was interviewed, how does it feel? Because I knew in that moment it just hit him, yep. all the things he had been through, like the lows of the lows. Yeah, I, and, I, 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 I could see that too. And I was I saw the lows with him. Yeah. So to see him have the highs, it was just a very nice moment. It would have been a great moment. And I think now I had this chat a couple of weeks ago. So I just turned 30 recently and – the what, ath- a, what an old bastard! <laughs> the the athletes that I coached at, in my in my early like twenties, right? They're also getting, you know, they're also aging as I age. So Tyson's thirty one now. Yep. George is turning thirty soon. Yep. You know, Ebony's uh, thirty five or six right now. So is, it, isn't that a story? In the next five years, it definitely is. In the next five years, a lot of the athletes that became you know, the, the famous guys, yep. they're probably not going to be fighting anymore. They'll no. be doing other things in their careers, in, yep. their, in, their, in their life. And so I'm trying to now apply the same passion and purpose that I had to the younger generation of athletes that we work with yep. to give them the same opportunities and better opportunities through what we can do so they can have the same platforms. Um, and that's not to say that we take sole responsibility for giving them, giving them these opportunities. It's more so as in, Keeping the the passion and being able to continue sharing that with my coaching team and making sure they can apply that to the young athletes that are walking through our doors every day. And, and probably teaching them the mistakes that were made by the champions or failures, so to speak, yep. at certain stages. You can take that that learning and, and pass it on to them and say, this is what happened with this person. Definitely. Then 
Yeah, that's your job as a coach because you've overseen that career. Now you're focused on that career. Correct. The um, one of my one of my closest friends he mentioned a term. It's called the like the consummate professional, which is someone who's a professional in pretty much everything that they do. And that's I try and be like that because I know that my athletes that are the athletes that we work with, um, they're looking at what I do. And in some ways, I know that I'm almost a I won't say a role model, but I'm someone they look to as an example of how I conduct myself and that, that then not justifies, it gives them clarity in, in saying, oh, that's my coach. I'm proud to have that person as my coach. Yep. And so I, I always try to be that person because I want to be that person. That's right. That's right? right. And that comes back to me being the coach that I wish I had. Yeah. That, yep. that consummate professional, yep. that guy that cares. It's there for you when you need someone to be there for you. Yeah. Now I, I, I've seen a lot of that at Jackson's Winkle uh, over in Albuquerque. And when they had all the professional fighters, like some of the biggest names in the world, and they always, whether they get asked the question or interviewed, they were they were happy. This, this is what struck me as this gym is where I want to sort of learn some, some life lessons and some martial arts uh, lessons as well. How the fighters were happy that they won for the coach. Yep. Like Greg Jackson, Winkle John. These guys like Carlos Condon, the, you, you know, the Bones Jones, Holly, they were more ecstatic about winning for their coaches yep. than what they were for themselves. You see that so often though. Remember like even when Israel, I think it's when he won the interim title and he he gave the belt over to Eugene. To Eugene, yes. Because, I mean, I don't know the extent of that relationship, but you could imagine how much those two had been through together. Yeah, yeah. And so that's powerful. What coaches yep. really strive their whole life for is not only be a great coach, but a great mentor, a great brother, a great father, a great everything. It's just like a life lesson, isn't it? It's a, uh, you know, the saying success leaves clues. When you have so many success stories, there has to be something that's repeating itself and that that it's 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 working. So if you look at City Kickboxing, and I, I just overheard Tyson uh Earlier, he was doing an interview and they asked him the same question. Like, What's it like over there? And he, he, he kind of nailed, nailed that question on the head when he, when he mentioned the culture. And when you look around and there are so many other high level athletes, it's clear that there's a culture that stems from top down that breeds that sort of an environment. And I think that comes from the coaches and then it comes from the key athletes that are there. That's right. So Israel, Dan, Brad, yep. Shane, et cetera. Yep. They, they then become the, almost like the, well, yeah. the, the role models basically well, for correct. the next yeah, generation. They become the figures to the to the tier down, right? And th that doesn't make them better than the tier down. It just it, it just gives you an example of what it looks like if you follow the path. If you if you want to be at that level, that's that's what it looks like. Correct. And I mean, I, I went there to two years ago, or did a year you? and a half ago. Yeah. Well, when Tyson was doing his rehab and he did his first trial camp, I wanted to see what that was going to be like, so I could get a better idea when it came to you know, managing his loads, his yeah. schedule, uh, programs for him, kind of what the demands were this, at the CKB camp, because I had heard that it was a very demanding camp mm. from, you know, J Jordan um, and got other guys that I work with. Yep. So when I went over there, I spent two weeks with Tyson. Um, I jumped in on some of the training sessions I watched and obviously I, I met a lot of the fighters uh, and that was, it was really cool to see that because- I was going to say, it's a bu it's a buzz, it'll be a buzz for you too in regards to entering a-, a a closed door environment to yeah. those type of people, but then you get that door open because with Tyson, Correct. but that's the buzz of going, wow, I'm going to see what, what all the talk is about Correct. here. And then the, the, the nicest part was how welcoming that place was. Yeah. So welcoming. Yeah. Um, I remember Dan Hooker was teaching a class and he's like, yeah, man, just jump in. I remember I didn't have like, um, I didn't have my headgear on a uh, mouth guard. I ran to the reception. I quickly bought a mouth guard, went upstairs, boiled it in their kitchen upstairs, put it in and went downstairs and started training. Yeah. And then, you know, I met Kai over there. Kai's an absolute gentleman. Champion. Such a nice guy. Very hospitable. In invited us out to places. I met Carlos, et cetera. Yeah. So when, you, when you're there, it's clear why they are- That environment's like that. Correct. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. You know, if the coach is closed-minded and they think they know everything, that's when they stop learning and that's when they stop being coaches. Yep. And that's how I sort of looked at it when I was traveling to Jackson Wink. I was like- even if they come up and say, Rich, that's that's how we want you to do pad holding for this person or that person. I didn't go, mate, this is I know what I'm doing here. Of course. I'd be going, okay. At first, sometimes I was like, that's a bit weird. 
But then I I'd done a few practice and I was like, fuck that, that's actually pretty good. That makes sense. That's why they're doing that. Yep. Because MMA, as you know, is different to Muay Thai, is different, different to sports. karate, different stances, different, different everything. Yeah, of course. You know, you've got nine nine sort of things or probably more with the weapons available with MMA yep. than Muay Thai with eight, they're, eight they're, weapons, they're boxing two. Sports, yeah. Right. So it takes a good coach. To mould all that Correct. into a into a pad holding and spot spot fighters that have different styles that are better at certain certain qualities, yeah. heavy athletes, grappling heavy athletes, yeah, and then still still highlight what they're good at, yet develop all the other things they need for a sport like MMA. Hundred percent, and that's yeah. From your point of view, the strength conditioning, yes, you know, you going around learning all different things, but then putting that into pro the process of seeing your you know, seeing what you're doing with the athletes yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, like, it's just as with any sort of, say, your coaching, as an example, you've taken bits and pieces from all your experiences and then you have your own philosophies that develop over time and your style that develops over time. It's the same with what I do. Uh, I haven't reinvented the wheel. I've just, uh, you know, it's, one of my friends gave me an analogy uh, and I kind of explain this now when, you know, he says, what, what makes you, as in me, better than another coach when it comes to working with a combat athlete. And I normally say, if you, if you have a baker and that baker makes all, all sorts of pastries and he does a fantastic job, but you want a croissant, right? And then there's a baker down the road. All he does is make croissants every single day. He will know the little intricacies about baking croissants better than the guy who does everything. And that's kind of like yeah. my me with combat athletes, it's all I've done for the last seven to eight years. Yeah. I haven't worked with any other athletes. Yeah. And it's not to say that there aren't things that are very similar in terms of physical qualities that you develop with athletes. All athletes need to have a certain level of strength and yeah. conditioning, et Definitely, cetera. Yeah. But there are little nuances that you pick up in, in how to communicate with a combat athlete in the things that you might not see if you don't work with them every single day. Yeah, yeah. Ways to communicate, common things that they do, common things that they don't do. And that just comes with reps, yep. right? It's like, how do you get better at the sport? You just keep doing yeah, the sport. Like, get good, like get a good muscle reps memory in. type setup. Get yeah. good reps in. So every day, all the athletes that I work with, they're fighters um, across several different sports, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, Muay Thai, MMA, boxing, at low levels to the highest levels in the world. Mm. And so after a while, you, you get pretty good at baking croissants. Yeah, right? that's it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so my, again, and I completely agree with you. I think a curiosity to learn is important. And the the day you lose that, I don't think you just stop being a good coach. I think you're just pointless in life, really. Yeah, the, pur um, the purpose just really isn't there correct. anymore. Yeah. And Kobe Bryant, one of his first rules was to learn every single day. And it doesn't mean you have to just learn about the coaching. That's right. You learning about something else will probably still make you a better coach. Yep. because you might meet someone who you can then talk to about that that's, thing that you that's learned. That's right, that's right? right. For example, you meet a Kurdish person tomorrow. You can say, holy, whoa. I, there's two it, of them. There's two of you guys hey. now, right? 100%. And, th and that's just you having a curiosity to learn. And yeah. you wouldn't have- you wouldn't have a podcast if you didn't have that curiosity. No, well, that's- Because uh, you wouldn't spend time talking to people. That's right, that's right. And that's what I said, and I've said along all the way with the projects is, it's just the not so, uh, curiosity too, but I'm just fascinated. One, people's journeys and where they come from and, and where they're actually heading. And, and sometimes if it's athletes and sometimes if it's coaches, it's the mindsets that they have. Yep. That gets them through the sacrifices when you said, I've got to go on PT there. I'm doing free sessions with the athletes there so I can get my credibility, but I get to learn as well. And that continues. <clears throat> the the sacrifices, the risk taking, it continues. When you when you sign a lease, when you take a loan out to buy equipment, That's when right. you take another loan out to grow the business and invest in more equipment, yep. when you, you know, have to change things up because there's a, a a sudden pandemic in the world. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Those are all challenges, 100%. right? And I think how you respond to those challenges is very important. Yeah. A, it gives you character and it shows, I think you're able to see to yourself how you respond to hard situations. Correct. And again, when you're working with athletes, particularly combat athletes, now it's not to take away from other athletes and other sports, but the consequences are just different in combat sports. People yep. can die in the ring. They can die in the cage. Percent, correct. It's, it's not like, you know, losing a match. You, you can legitimately be concussed. You can be paralyzed after getting hit in the face. Yep. So 
I, I think that in itself, it's, it makes that sort of a, that, that person, a, a unique person, you know, I mean, you, you've seen the nature of fight week when mm. you get to see the transition of the attitude of the person yeah, when yeah. they realize that it's getting quite close now That's and right. they need to cut weight and they need to go through that, 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 that whole experience yep. and then come fight night. It's, it's such a raw feeling. Yep. You know, like I've been in the corner with fighters at the UFC. I've been backstage. Um, I walked out with George for his first fight against Haney and I was holding one of the belts and I just remember my heart was pumping. Whoa, man. I, I remember this feeling yep. so vividly. My heart was pumping so much and I thought, how the, is, how, how's, how does he feel right now? Oh my God. How does he feel with 40,000 people watching him and he's about to defend all these I'll belts? Tell you, I'll tell you what, I hadn't, I hadn't seen before him like – too many athletes that had his confidence and he's no what is, I don't even call it arrogance I just call it confidence and just, I don't think it's arrogance no nah, but but some people but call it accident it, it uh, can be perceived as arrogance that's right definitely, that's right yeah because obviously you know when he's talking so confident about himself society these days goes geez he's arrogant yep. well he's uh, but that's like anything tall puppy everyone wants to knock the yeah. the the person who's Trying to be positive and and win his way to the championships. I think everyone wants to tear him down, don't there's, they? There's was a, you know that other saying. It's like winners focus on winning. Yep, and, and losers focus on winners. That's right. That's right. right. And it's a hundred percent true. And I mean, if 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 you look at someone like George and you spend time and look, we live in a digital era where it's very easy to back someone. It's like you go do it. Easy, just sit there and go. Did it? There you go. I've just. Yeah, oh, I took. Okay, you go do it. Hundred percent. Right. Go through you, the you, sacrifices he's made. Most people won't even be most people won't even be able to last one week with the the training regimen. I was going to say not have. not not especially George is like well any, he, like I mean yeah. you go and do one week of training at CKB at Jackson's that's right uh, you won't last no yet it's quite easy to comment on something that's right that's know? right yeah if it's uh, if it, if it's in that part so you got the ethos is going charging on. You're obviously in the athletes' uh, corners when you when you're doing these uh, training camps, but they're doing it. What's what's the the future from now? Obviously, growing ethos to be. Uh, what? How big's the space you've got now? It's just under three hundred square meters, so it's not too big. Okay, okay. The, we've been in this spot for three years now. Yep. The dream is to have a a bigger facility. Yep. Um, how, how big does ethos want to go? Uh, I'd like it to be almost. Kind of like a mini institute. Okay. That's what I'd like. I'd like it to have, because we don't just work with combat athletes at the facility. Um, we've got a designated team that works with different athletes, rugby league athletes. We're yeah. some of the best, you know, rugby, basketball athletes in the country. Yep. Best soccer players in the country. Uh, but my focus purely is on the combat yep. sector in that area. And so the goal is to have a, a facility that has, you know, recovery centers in yeah. built, um, a, a, a cafe, uh, assistance with nutrition and those sorts of things. Um, essentially where an athlete could come and have every single thing looked after for them. Yep. And to some, to some degree they can now, yeah. but not to the standard that I'd like it to, yep. but I always play the long game um, and I'm not in a rush. Yep. I think as long as things are growing linearly over time and I'm challenged and I feel, I feel purpose in what I do and I feel What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, stimulated and yeah, I'm enjoying yeah. the process. Motivated. Then yeah. I'm happy, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, you know how it is running a business. It's it's difficult. Yeah. It comes with challenges because as the business grows, the team grows. That's right. And managing and leading people is a uh, is a job in itself. Especially in these days, it well, seems to be a little bit harder outside of COVID. But it's 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 definitely harder. I think it's the the nature of the way people communicate and expectations. Are obviously, they're just changing. Yeah, and so. I think with a growing business and a growing team, I also want to make sure I have the right team as we grow. That's right. And people will come, people will go. That's that's a, that's the normal cycle. But the 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 vision for me has always been to have a global impact on combat sports. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. That's the ethos vision statement, right? Yep. Uh, and I can confidently say that I think I think we and I achieved that as to where we are at the moment. Yeah, yeah. But I'd like to have a big institute. I want to. Uh, we had our first education event two weeks ago. Uh, so yep, yep. ethos education will be something that I want to push yeah, cool, cool. Uh, because I can appreciate how impactful a good mentor can be because I've had good mentors. Yep. And so I'd like to also continue and develop being that mentor for other coaches in the future yep. and other practitioners. Yep. And ultimately the whole goal is to just improve the landscape of high performance in combat sports. Yeah. That's the big focus. Okay. Um, if we can, 
help more coaches, help more practitioners and improve the standards overall, then it just, what's the saying? The, it raises the tide for all the ships. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the goal. I'd like to make ethos have different branches under it. So high performance for combat athletes, high performance for different sort of athletes, yep. education. I'm starting a mentorship soon. So I've been working on that in the background. Yeah. Good. Um, and then who knows, right? Who knows? And as I get a little older, invest in different things yeah, and yeah. challenge myself in different ways. And that's what I was going to say because you're so busy and focused and driven by by what I'm hearing there. What What's me do outside of all the strength and conditioning? And yeah, so what's, what's, your, what's your downtime? What, what do you like to do? You know, Rich, it's something that I always advocated very strongly because, so again, this is, I'm, I'm very – very grateful for all the experiences I had in my twenties because it was very eventful. And one of the things I always try and do is just live the fuck out of every day um, and wake up every day and like, just get after it Yeah, because it could be a story I tell myself, but my people, Kurdish people have been oppressed for centuries. We don't have a country. Nobody even knows about us at the moment in um, Syria and Iran, that tragic earthquake happened. And all people think is that it's Syrian and Turkish people Turkish, that have been yeah. killed. But it's actually a lot of Kurdish people also that have been hidden in identity that are being oh, killed. Because yeah, yeah, if you're a that. Kurdish person and you're in Turkey, you can't identify yourself as Kurdish. Okay. It's, it's against the law. Wow. And it's similar in certain areas of Syria. So Rudor, the region that's had that earthquake, it's actually a lot of Kurdish people too that are killed. Wow. And so oppression and not being known and being able to say we have a country and our own identity it's something that for me is like my parents came here as immigrants mm. and they pretty much sacrificed everything to be here. Wow. My mom came here pregnant with my younger brother. Yeah. Um, they spoke no English at all, had no support structures here. My dad was working at Coal, at uh, Franklin's. Oh, Remember Fra Franklin's? Yeah, Franklin's, Franklin's back in the day. at Auburn. He was working wow. pushing trolleys for four bucks an hour. My mom was making kebabs <laughs> while she was pregnant with my little brother while she was trying to learn English. Well, that, that just shows you the sacrifices. And, right. and, and, and I guess for me, it's like, what's your excuse, man? Like, what, 100%. And you, that's what I, was, I touch on when they when I say sacrifices. They were hard sacrifices back then. Different sacrifices. But you see, you see what the next generation goes through now, and they're like, oh, my God, I've, I've got it bad. And you think to yourself, man, you ain't. They got, don't know what bad is. No. But that's, relative that's probably, to what they can know, it's, it's bad to them. Yeah. That's I probably, guess you can't deny that, right? No. But- the, and what I was saying is I've always tried to live life and enjoy life. And so when I graduated university in 2013, I spent a year traveling with my best friend and we went all over South America, Latin America, Central America, wow. did 16 countries that year. Went yeah, to the World wow. Cup, saw Ronaldo, saw Messi, yeah. went to Rio, just turned 21 that trip. So I had a blast oh of the time. Oh my God. Went to Cuba. It was, it was unbelievable. Wow. And I, I learned Spanish on that trip. So I speak quite fluent Spanish as really? well. Really? Wow. So I speak three languages. And what I'm getting at is, all those experiences made me be able to relate to athletes in a unique way. Um, and I think hobbies make you a more interesting person yeah. and it allows you to connect with different types of people. Yeah. Uh, so if I meet an athlete who likes dogs, I, I know I can instantly connect with that person because right. I love dogs. Yeah. If I meet an athlete that speaks Spanish, but their English isn't so good, That's I'm right. like, I can warm you up a little now. Yeah, right? you're right. Yeah, yeah. And so- Hobbies for me has always been traveling. I love to travel. Yep. Um, I've been to a lot of countries in the world and look forward to traveling again this year oh, yeah, with yeah. my partner. Yep. Uh, and it's dogs. Yeah, dogs. So I've got a Belgian Malinois. He's a working line dog. They're like German shepherds on crack. Really? Best way to put them. <laughs> so they're psychotic. They don't stop. And oh. I think the reason I love him so much is because his energy levels match my energy Yeah, levels. I was going to say, that who, who takes after who then? So we, you know, when I, in the mornings we wake up, he puts his leash on, um, his collar on, sorry. We get in the car. I've built like a whole dog box for him <laughs> in the back of the car. We go to the gym, put him in his crate. We go and train. We go hiking. We go swimming. Oh, wow. Um, so he's competing this year and he does protection work too. Oh, really? So yeah. Bi biting and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so, right. Um, he's Damn. competing in April. My dog. I still train a lot, obviously. I love training. Yeah. Um, I'm still involved in martial arts. I still- that's what yeah. I said to you when you were wearing the singlet down. So I was like, damn, bro, you <laughs> pumped up. You got to practice, <laughs> preach what you practice, yeah, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I was going to say that. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's traveling. It's my dog. Um, I like cooking. I love music. Yeah. Uh, I love plants. So I look after a lot of plants. Yeah, true. As well. Yeah, well, that's cool. Um, so I think it's, it's important to develop things outside of the, the, the craft you're involved in, yep. because I think that all of those things make you better at your craft. True. Um, and it makes you more interesting as a person. Yep. And then you can relate to different sorts of people. Yeah. So I remember, as just another example, 
one of these one of the MMA athletes I was working with, I remember him leaving the gym and he stopped and he goes, Oh, I know that plant. He goes, I have one of those plants. I would have never picked this guy, five and a five and a knockouts wow. to like plants. Yeah. And then we instantly just went, oh. Yeah, right. It just, it just moved, connected. It just moved all of or any of the tension that existed at the time. Wow. And so hobbies is are super important. And I think I tell mm. any young coach or any person, but let's keep it to the to why I, I guess my my industry is I tell mm. any young coach to develop your hobbies and yeah. do things outside of the the work because it's important for your development as as a person. Yeah, right. Wow, that's that's a crazy thing. And, if and I, cars, cars. I have a really. I have an eighty six uh, VL Bellina Commodore. Um, had it since I was seventeen. Oh wow! Red restored mint condition oh is mint. that the retirement fund maybe i actually said that the other day <laughs> Did you? i said i'm never selling it till i, I was retire. gonna say wow i bought it for two and a half thousand it's valued at 60 right now what how funny <laughs> is that and it, over the years all my mates sold their souped up cars my mate had a uh evo 9 and mr my other friend had australia's fastest rx7 sold it he sold it wow you, you, get old. A, you, you yeah, grow up yeah. like, you get kids and you buy a house and i just i could never really the money was never the thing with the car. I thought, yeah. well, if I sell it, I get 30 grand. I can't open a gym with 30 grand, so uh, I'll just keep the car. Yeah. And then these days I'm like, well, with 50 grand, I can't really expand the gym with 50 grand or do much with it. Uh, and I like the car. Yeah. I just, I just keep the car. Yeah. So. Wow. That's a that's very smart move, my friend. Very yeah. <laughs> smart move. So all that very interesting story. I love it. I love it. What, if I was to say, what is me rich life at present? What is your rich life right now? And when I say rich, people I'm not people think, oh, when you say rich life, it's money, it's whatever, but it's really what's in your heart that makes you happy. What is me is rich life at present? I really like that question, Rich. That's I a know. Good question. It, you'd be amazed how many different questions uh, different answers I get from what, it. What is my rich life? As in what makes me happy? I think for me, it's the autonomy to do what I want to do to, 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 to an extent. Uh, I think to me, success is being able to do what you enjoy doesn't necessarily mean success is money. Cause I know, and the studies show that there are a lot of people that make a lot of money that are miserable. I so I think that, if you're, yes. if you're guided by money as the only thing in life, it's important. Money is a catalyst to affect change in things. True. If I don't have money, I can't build the better gym. That's if true. I have money, I probably, if I didn't have money, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I want to do that is and true. help the people that I want to do. I think money is a, the way you spend your money is it, it kind of, it, it it shows you a lot about who you are, right? Yep. So if you gave me a million dollars right now, I'm not disappearing. I'm going to build that facility. I That's right. I was going to say hundred percent. So what makes me, what's my rich life is being able to do the things I love being here right now, being here in fight week and being able to express the things that I love without anybody telling me that I can't do it. Oh, amen to that one, brother. Mate, honestly, it's uh, I've always been interested in and hoping we cross paths. We're supposed to do this for the Cambosis. I part. know, we just were, busy. we were. just. You, just I busy. know, you were so busy. I know I was booked or Braden had me booked up somewhere. But, yeah. mate, I just want to uh, I appreciate your time today. I really i love the story there are a lot of things i didn't know about you but now Likewise. i do Likewise. but um but yeah i just appreciate your time mate and thank you for being on the rich life Thanks, project rich. i appreciate you i feel richer right now oh <laughs> <yee -hoo! laughs>